I try to read as much as I can, as much as I can understand as well, about AI, the various forms of AI and the various forms of impact, positive and negative, and quite hard to establish really, that AI will have on our personal lives, on our economic lives, on our medical lives, and so on. Fascinating article on Daily Maverick at the moment by Bruce Bassett, Jonathan Schock, and our next guest, Benjamin Rosman, where they put forward a vision of the near-term future and discuss how to adapt and prepare for it effectively, especially in the African context. But what, first, what if you are an AI skeptic, they write, believing that AI is mostly hot air and hype and will go through a sudden sharp crash like some cryptocurrencies and NFTs. As an aside, there's another article I was reading this morning in one of the overseas newspapers that I get digital versions of saying what has happened to non-fungible tokens. They were all the rage and now nobody talks about them. They go back. This is a valid concern. The difference lies in the scale of AI adoption by hard-nosed businesses hell-bent on improving efficiencies, integration with existing systems, as well as the clear path to further improvements of AI. Simply put, employers will likely increasingly face a choice. Try to make their employees more productive with AI tools or choose to replace many of them entirely. Benjamin Rosman is, amongst many other things, a professor in the School of Computer Sciences at Applied Maths at Wits University. Benjamin, good afternoon. Thanks for your time. Hi. Hi. How are you? I, I'm worried about the future of my job. <laughs> I, I think we all are at the moment. I mean, not just your job, but everybody's. I mean, you, you can realistically foresee a scenario where, what, 99% of the jobs being done by humans on the planet at the moment could be done by AI in 10, 15, 20 years? So that's the, I guess, in some ways the exciting thing and in other ways the concern. Um, you know, we, we, we all, all that humans do is either physical labor or cognitive labor. And we've seen the physical labor get automated in different ways in the past. But this is really where it's the cognitive labor that's, that's kind of being challenged. And to some extent, you know, us who work in the field, we don't really see that there's anything that fundamentally a machine couldn't do. And so we're left in this interesting situation where as the potential for more and more automation is, is, is growing, um, what does it mean for all of us? And what does it mean for all of us? I mean, if, if a machine could do many jobs at the moment better than the humans doing at the moment, most jobs better than most humans in five years' time, and almost every job better than just about every human in 10 years' time, what are the implications of that? How does one prepare for a future in, that, in which that is possible? I mean, this is the question, right? Because I don't know if this is a trillion-dollar question or more at this point. You know, we, we haven't had to deal with this kind of scenario before, you know, we, we don't know what happens when we pour out huge amounts of intelligence um, into the world where it wasn't there before. If, if you look back at kind of the way people would have thought about this a few years ago, I mean, even just over a year ago, they might have said, huh, you know, you'll, you'll never have a machine doing something creative. Yet, you know, we just look back at the last year and look at everything from chat GPT writing sonnets to... Dali and Midjourney creating crazy images to see that that's possible, albeit with some caveats. And, you know, I, I think this means we need to actually take a look at where we are and, and where we're going. And what I've been working with with these colleagues of mine is, is really trying to think about this question of, of what does it mean? Is this a, a threat to us? Is this a huge opportunity? And I think it, it is how we embrace and how we deal with this technology. You know, do we ignore it? Do we pretend that it's it's not real and, you know, suffer the consequences? Or do we try and embrace it? But if we're doing that, we should be doing it in a responsible way. And we think that there's a lot of opportunities, for example, to help grow small businesses, right? To anyone entrepreneurially minded could build the thing they've always wanted to build. We could kind of really usher in a whole new era of, opportunities and, and exciting endeavors. And I think, you know, we've got to change our mindset and how we think about 
really our work and how that ties to our income and the ability of us to to survive as people by doing work that pays us. Yeah, and, see, I, I, most people in business are not most people in business. Let me not make statements that I can't back up, but I suspect that there are quite a number of people in business whose primary goal is to maximize the profit inherent in that business model. And if you can get a machine at a cost which does the work of 25 human beings at less of a cost than those 25 human beings and does it more reliably, doesn't require sick days and holidays and um, take time off for um, family deaths days, then, you know, who's not going to do it? Who, who's going to go, hold on a second, I have... I have a moral responsibility to humanity to keep humans employed because if I don't, what happens to them and what does that do to the future? That's exactly right. And, you know, I think the we're, we're not quite at the point where, you know, this AI is doing everything that a human could do better than them. Um, but I think this year has certainly been a bit of a wake-up call. Um, you know, many of us, as I say, were, were kind of trying to shout this from the parapets before, but but I think people are realizing it now. We're at the stage, you know, you use ChatGPT, you can use a, a handful of these tools and they can make you considerably more productive, but it doesn't take long before everyone being a bit more productive means fewer people are needed, as you as you point out. And, and I think here is, you know, th this is a challenge that we've got to think about how we, how we deal with it. And I think just kind of, Pretending it's not going to happen is is quite foolish. Yeah, and and just marching ahead, letting you know whatever happens is also equally foolish. We've got to really really think about this. And so you know, there's been a lot of discussion of late about what does this mean for regulation, um, partially in terms of the kinds of models that can be built. But I, I think this also talks to the way that these these models and this AI is used. There's for a long time there's still going to be a number of limitations. You're going to need people to be working alongside the AIs and watching out for for terrible things. Um, but I think really there's a there's a longer term picture that we have to be thinking about, which is, you know, is there a law of the universe that says that there will always be enough jobs for all people? And I, I don't think there is. And I think um, AI is just showing us that at the moment. And perhaps, you know, we need to move to, to think about different models of yeah. how we want to run our economy and how we want companies to run because it, it just doesn't seem sustainable the way we're doing things at the moment. You, you give a couple of examples of programs or systems, I don't know what one would properly call them, OpenAI's Advanced Data Analytics, ADA, AutoGPT and MetaGPT, things that are out there at the moment that are, again, as a phrase that you use in the piece, exponentially improving. And you, you say, the three of you, imagine an AI agent which never sleeps and learns to do your job far faster than you did. It can do this because it's not just replacing you, but replacing people with your job title across the world, getting advice and feedback from all bosses and managers around the world. Such a scenario is not merely speculative. It is likely already being built. And so what is the process by which the right kinds of conversations are held between the right kinds of people, which then allow something which is both good for people and for businesses. Right. So, so that's exactly, you know, what we try to achieve by writing an article like this, because I don't think it should be left to the scientists and engineers building the technologies to figure out what is the right way for this to, to interact with, um, with humanity. You know, for example, do we need economic models that say, you know, for you, you have to employ some number of people uh, based on what your profits are, or um, and and that could be supporting people in other ways. You know, we, I think we've got to be a bit more creative and plodding along with the same models we have. And this is where we need everybody from ethicists and sociologists and economists to really join the discussion. And I think we're just in the early days of that, and it's it's really exciting and refreshing to see that that's starting to happen. Thank you very. I don't. I don't know whether to be excited or depressed. I'm. I'm flipping between each of those poles every ten seconds about this. But I'm glad we had the conversation. Thank you for making yourself available. Benjamin Rossman is a professor in the School of Computer Sciences and Applied Mathematics 
at Wits University. Phil says from the U.S., I wonder if the human race will be able to work out that they may become defunct if they continue to invent such amazing things as AI. Hopefully sanity will prevail. How about we replace our current government with AI? We vote AI, not ANC. Um, I do employ people rather than machines, says somebody, just that the kind of people I employ are of the old school who take pride in their jobs, don't ever take advantage. Joe says there will be such competition for those jobs that AI can't do that the wages for those jobs will drop.